This time on Pedalbox, we're doing work on the Golf with more hand-me-down parts. It's safe to say the Golf has been neglected for about the past year, maybe even two years, since we did a couple of bits and tried to get it on the road to take to the track. Unfortunately that didn't happen, but now there's a few more hand-me-down parts we can put on this to replace some other hand-me-down parts that it's had pretty much since it was built. The brakes I've got at the moment are 288mm discs, and I've got some yellow stuff pads, but that's the only upgrade I've really made to it. When I got them, the discs in here, the drilled ones, were part worn, but they still had a lot of life left in them, so there was no point just throwing them away for the sake of it. Now I've been using these and I've put maybe 15, 16,000 miles on this car and they haven't really worn down that much. But I don't like drilled discs because they tend to crack. And if I'm going to get new discs, I might as well get new pads and new calipers and generally go for a bigger brake upgrade. So that's why I went with the 16 inch wheels, expecting I was going to do this upgrade a long time ago. And I think I've had these wheels for about six or seven years now. Now Sean very graciously gave us his TT for the cause and on the front of his TT are the 312mm discs and pads and calipers that I wanted to put on this. So it's very convenient that I can just swap them on and everything will work. We thought about putting them on the other car but such a huge amount of unsprung weight is probably going to be detrimental to a car that light and it's probably not going to need them. Whereas this being very front heavy will probably benefit a bit more from it. Now the struts in here aren't the original ones that I got swapped in with the car either. I did put these ones in about a year or so later and they're just some stiffer springs but otherwise they're normal struts. So I'm going to pull these ones out and put the coilovers in that we got for the project. Now our kit car only needed the rears and I specifically bought Mark II Mark III rears because they were simple enough to fit and convert to fit on that. But also because it came as a set of four it meant I got some new front coilovers to put on this. So after a bit of a fight and some spilled brake fluid, now I've got the caliper off. You can actually see it's been a couple of different colours before. It's been yellow and red and black. I'll try and remember to put a close-up of that on the video a little bit later. But more importantly, you can compare the discs a bit more visually. So this is a 288mm in front and a 312 behind. And you see there's only about half an inch difference in it, but it does give you a good deal extra braking force, which is really good news. Now the yellow stuff pads that I've got on here might still work in the new calipers because they're still 54mm pistons on both of these. It's just the wider radius that gives you the extra braking force, but I'm not sure. Fortunately, when Sean put these discs on, he also put yellow stuff EBC pads on, so I'm good either way. Now I'm going to give this a good clean up because this has never been cleaned since I've built it and I don't think I gave it a proper clean even then. So I'm going to take off about 12 years worth of grime and rust and see what we get down to. Maybe give it a quick spruce up with some paint and then put it all back together on with the new ones. But we are going to have to make a little shim first. Have you ever worked on a car so little you forgot what parts you put on it? Because I was today years old when that first happened to me because it turns out I have put some coilovers on this before and although they are basically completely generic, unknown, no-name coilovers, they are also almost identical to these ones that we have left over. So I don't see the point in putting these on because these at least also match the coilovers I apparently put on the rear of the car. So these will stay these will go back in the shed and I'll move on. As I'm now not removing these coilovers, I'm just going to paint everything I can in situ and just mask off as best I can so I don't get it everywhere and paint the inside of this and all the rest of it, which is still covered in dirt. So the arms themselves aren't bad. There's still a lot of paint there, but there's definitely some surface corrosion on it, which I'm going to uh, put a bit of primer and a bit of paint on. Same goes for this hub arm as well. 
At the top, it's relatively well rusted, but actually around the majority of the body, it's pretty good. It's still doing okay. What is very evident is the rest of the underside needs a lot of TLC. Like, this is all rusted from lack of use and various other bits, so I'm going to clean all of this down at a later date and really go through the engine bay and tidy a lot of stuff up, probably in the next episode. So the new disc's on and the caliper carrier's in, but if you tighten the caliper carrier down all the way, you end up tightening the backside of it onto the back of the disc. Basically this section here, where the inner part would sit and the piston would sit on, this ends up running into the disc, and if it does run into the disc and you've locked it in place, your wheel doesn't spin anymore. So I've got this held off ever so slightly so I can see how thick I need to make this spacer. And that's the only thing you really need to do on these to make them fit. I don't have any 6mm stock to make the spacers out of, but I do have 3mm by 30mm bar, which I can use to make a pair for each side and then weld them together once they've been fitted to shape around this. So I've just marked out on here what size we're going to need. And actually, if I just test it in the back of here for thickness, three millimeters surprisingly close. So I'm going to make two of these up, clamp them down and see how close they get, put the piston on and see where it sits. But I suspect I'll have to make four. So this is our spacer, six millimeters. Three wasn't quite enough. It was still hitting the inside when it was fully tightened down. So I've just welded these two together, put a couple of spots on. It's going to be in compression, so it shouldn't have a lot of force and this will just fit on the back of the caliper carrier like this and then bolt onto the back of the hub. Before I put these bolts in, I'm going to do what I did last time and put some copper grease on because that made an enormous amount of difference getting these loosened. Otherwise, I suspect they probably would have been pretty badly rusted in. But it actually came out reasonably well, although one of them was oddly tight, which I think was this one because it didn't have any copper slip where the threads actually sat. All the copper slip was further up which is no good. So I'll put these in and we'll get on with it. Way back in episode four, we tried to get this running again so we could go to Roadkill at EBC and there was a fire. Oh, fire! Fortunately, the damage was pretty minimal. It melted through the bottom of this intake line, which I'd been meaning to replace for a while because the breather pipe was broken, so I guess half a win there. And the fuel lines melted all the way back to the firewall. And that means you've got about two feet of this flexi pipe that just snakes its way round from the top of the engine at the front all the way down to the firewall at the back. And that's more of a problem because there's no real good way to kind of mount it without it just getting in the way. And it's a lot of big flexi rubber hose. And if that breaks again, it's just more distance for it to potentially leak out of. On the TT and the A3 platforms, all the hard lines come up to this point, just on the front of the suspension turret. They come up through this section and mount into this little clip bracket onto the front of here. And then all of the takeoff lines go from there. So I pulled these out from underneath the car and using a bit of hot water to heat up the plastic and some grease on the end of the socket, I managed to fit these in. So I'll feed these back into the engine bay and then start on the other end. So I've connected the two lines onto the stubs that come from underneath the car and I've cut down this piece of plastic that's a guard on the TT that protects these pipes from the heat of the engine bay and the exhaust and everything else. So I'll use this just to help direct these round a little bit and protect them in the same way. There's a little hole and a bung on the chassis leg that goes down that this fits into, which is really convenient. So that's actually quite secure once it's all the way in. The intake and the air filter are held up by the throttle body and then this little bracket that bolts onto the front of the suspension tower. Now what I'm going to do is add a little extra bracket on with a threaded section that goes in down here, exactly like it would on the original car, and then some tabs that this will hang off. So this will bolt on down this side, like this, with the air filter onto there and then this bracket will sit approximately there with the tubes coming up into the top. What's another good episode on the Golf? We didn't have a fire, we've prevented future fires, and we've put better brakes on it, so I think that's a win all round. If you'd like to check out shop.pedalbox.show for our merch, t-shirts, hats, and more. And if you'd like to support the channel, patreon.com slash pedalboxshow will help us keep us in welding gas and wire.
There's more work to be done on the Golf, so I'm going to get some more of that done for another episode of Fleet coming up. And we've also done a load of work on the kit car, so hopefully there should be more of that to come too. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.